right, all right. Today on Off the Couch, this is Dr. Greg Kason. I'm here with etiquette expert Zoe. Hi, Zoe Yeoman. Hi, everyone. And producer Brian Gomez, who's who is uh, bringing some valuable insight about his personhood today. Because this week, we're going to actually cover quite a few things. I was so overwhelmed when I was going through the psychology studies this week. I needed five shows to go through all the cool stuff that was coming out. So I picked these because there seems to be a bit of a flow to it. But bear with me as we talk about these are some big stuff that came out this week. Who knew on Thanksgiving week? So we're going to talk about can magicians make mental illness disappear? Some surprising findings there. Surfing as a form of therapy. And what's making people, so many people, paranoid these days? And then we're going to talk about psychology in the news, and we're going to be talking about a Michigan hairdresser who is sending trans people to a pet groomer. And then lastly, Zoe, we're going to have you come in to tell us what to bring to a holiday event when the host tells you not to bring anything. This was really quite important because I hate the fact that these things happen. First of all, Brian, you said two shows ago that you were going to keep a daily journal. This was when you weren't here, Zoe. Tell me, Brian, did you keep a daily journal? (laughs) I hate to admit, I did not write in the mornings. I do have something else I do, though. I have a notepad of like sticky notes and in the morning, like, I always have, like, a ton of thoughts going through my head or, like, ideas or things I need to do. So I start jotting them down and putting them on, like, my kitchen wall. So I'm still writing, but not the 750 words. Well, in fact, writing 750 words, which is from the artist's way, doing that daily, has been shown to be very helpful. And, again, I'll recognize, I recommend that that website, 700, 750words.com. That's 750words.com. I think they're incredible incredibly valuable. They send you a prompt to write every day, um, but you can do it on your own or write in a journal, etc. Let me tell you what I just did, and I really failed last time, which is, as a psychologist, when you assign homework, you want to follow up with that homework. Um, and if you don't follow up, people learn that they're not accountable for the homework you give, so they don't do it which is very interesting. So as a, any therapist out there knows that they have to write down the homework that they gave to the client and follow up the next week or the client may not have done it. Now, if the client doesn't do it, how we would have handled that, like with Brian, um, I don't think I assigned you the homework. You assigned yourself, but I still would have gone along with it, let's say, if you were a patient. Um, but how you handle that is then you go, okay, well, maybe 750 words was too many. Let's take Take it down. What do you think would be a manageable amount for you to do? Oh, I feel like half of it, but I think my whole, I was the only one doing it. So if somebody else like yourself was doing it, I feel like I would have had that pressure or competitiveness to do it too. Well, you know, I'm a, I'm a cooperative person. I can agree to do that, but I don't know that I did last time. I just knew that I probably wouldn't have time. But nonetheless, uh, so if you, I don't know if you want to take on that homework again, but that's essentially how we would handle it. You do want to take it yeah, on? Yeah, I'm game. If you, But if you do it, I'll do it. That's the, how well, it works uh, with me. <laughs> I can barely have time to brush my teeth in the morning. But okay, uh, I'm not going to be uh, assigning this to myself, but I do think it's a valuable exercise and I might want to do that. Um, We'll check back in with me later about that. Meanwhile, let's talk about something I found super fascinating. Can magicians make mental illness disappear? Can you think of a comedian, actor, writer, or poet with mental illness, folks? Can you? Oh, come on, like... Like all of them. <laughs> like a, a ton. Um, oh, actor so Robin Williams was a recent one we all had to deal with. Comedian Stephen Fry, writer Virginia Woolf, we, full, Virginia Woolf, all of them have bipolar disorder, and they've been very public, or they were publicly known to have those things. But, um, but there are many, many creative types who have mental disorders. In fact, there's a creativity creativity and mental illness conference that happens once a year, which I think is incredibly fascinating. And it deals with, you know, people who are 
have mental illness but are also highly creative. And we see this overlap a lot. Um, People with mental illnesses such as schizophrenia are actually more likely to work in creative jobs. I think that's really fascinating. But what about magicians? And magicians seem to be this group that's always overlooked, like mimes, but mimes probably for a different reason. But creative, the magicians are creative professionals as well, but they're also highly technical. So this is really interesting. Previous studies have shown that members of creative groups like comedians and artists score higher on, than the norm on psychotic traits. And scientists score higher uh, score who are scientists in STEM, which is science, technology, engineering, and math, tend to score high on autistic traits. So they went, okay, you know, are magicians like scientists? Are they more like creative people? So this university, and I can I, I will butcher the name here, it's Abers Aberystwyth University in Wales, published in the Cambridge University Press in the BJ Psych Open, which is British Journal of Psychology Open. Um, They did a study of 195 magicians with an average of 35 years experience in the UK and the US, and they found some cool stuff with these people. Magicians display unique psychological traits. They actually score lower in nonconformity, um, so they tend to conform. And the psychotic traits compared, and they score lower, lower in psychotic traits. So they're not like the general population. The general population actually is more nonconformist and more, if you will, be. Uh, they tend to have more psychotic traits than magicians. How about that? Magicians, they're highly technical. Compared to other creative jobs, magicians exhibit a distinct psychological profile, aligning more closely with scientific and analytical professions. I I just found this interesting. (laughs) Makes sense. And magicians scored lower than the general population on psychosis measures. However, they didn't differ in terms of autism scores, which means they're just like the normal population in terms of autism. So they're not like they're not kind of like scientists who tend to be very geeky and might align more with people with autism. They're just like the normal population. In fact, magicians might be the people that you want to date. Let me tell you why. Um, Magicians demonstrate a high ability to concentrate. They have lower levels of social anxiety. They have fewer instances of unusual experiences, distorted thoughts, distorted thoughts or hallucinations. And these traits enable them to focus and pay attention without distraction. They also have no antisocial behavior and they have good behavioral self-control. Wow. These sound like the coolest people. And probably people who don't have these kinds of traits cannot be successful magicians because they can't focus. One little mistake and the and the trick just goes kabam. They also can do the same trick over and over and over again. It takes someone with extreme discipline to be able and high technical skill to be able to repeat the same trick over and over again. But they love to perform and they, they tend to be very creative in the way they devise their tricks. Because actually, I didn't know this. I was looking at this. Tricks can be done in many, many different ways. I just assumed there was one path to each trick. But it, they... they uh, analogize this to science experiments because certain science experiments can be done in different ways just like tricks can be done different ways to get the same result how about that well i think for all the single people out there they need to be hanging out at the magic castle (laughs) well you know that uh, magic castle which is here in los angeles which is a, a magic club it's a members only magic club if you can imagine that um i've been there twice um incredibly fun place to go uh and you just you just wander around and watch all these magic shows and your mind is blown by the end i mean you you can't believe you just had that night i think it helps they serve a lot of alcohol as you're going through (laughs) um the next one is interesting i thought because brian here has recently taken up surfing Isn't that right, Brian? Yes, I have. And I'm actually loving it. (laughs) It's one of the things I told myself I was going to get into and stay committed to it this year. And I'm glad I did. I'm really glad I did. And how often do you go? 
Uh, oh, the, if the weather was nice, sometimes I would leave early from work <laughs> during the week, but I would try to go like every weekend during the summer I was out there. And I mean, we have cold water either way. So if you have a wetsuit, it doesn't really matter if it's like cold or anything outside. Mm-hmm. Well, this uni- this study actually answered the question, does surfing improve your mental health? Now, this is a almost an economic study, so I don't know that it's necessarily answering this question in the best way, but they're looking at the economic impact of surfing on mental health. So they look at Griffith University uh, on Australia's Gold Coast, which is a surfing like Mecca, and also the Andres Belo University in Chile, Put, got together to do this study, both surfing locations. The study finds that surfing contributes $1 trillion a year to the global economy by improving the mental health of surfers. This is interesting to me because I grew up in a surf town, which is Huntington Beach. It's actually designated surf city of the United States. Um, and it's it, that was the whole thing growing up was surfing. And for me, the big thing we used to love was boogie boarding. Uh, for whatever reason, that was the big trend when I was a kid growing up and just loved going out and catching waves. Um, in the Gold Coast alone, though, they found that mental health benefits contribute Get this, 57 to 74 percent of total economic benefits from surfing due to mental health. Like the economic benefits to mental health are incredible. I totally, I totally buy this because it's exercise. You're outside, you're outdoors, adrenaline, getting better. Like Brian's going to get better every summer, every time, (laughs) every week he goes out there. He's just going to get better and better. And, and, you know, there's there's no way to surf in Albuquerque. You know what I'm saying? So, so these are areas where, where people are coming for the beautiful weather and the ocean and all of that. So yeah, economically that would be tremendous for the, for the town. Well, but yeah, they, they talked about that too. They said the benefits to the local economy, property and tourism amounted for between about 60 and 25, you know, 25 to 40% of the impact, but most of it was due to mental health. That's what was so cool. Uh, This was in the MPJ Ocean Sustainability Journal, and we're going to put links to these journals, um, to these articles, so people can take a look at them. But why do you think, Brian, you have to pay attention? Oh, why do you you think? I think I just gave (laughs) it away. gave it away. Oh, my goodness. Like you said, for me, (laughs) even if I'm not good, and I think this is common with anybody that takes up surfing, because I would go even alone. Um, It doesn't matter if, like, you know, at first it's a little intimidating to go out there, but there's a lot of people out there doing it alone as beginners too, because there's something just so nice of unplugging from everything. You're in the water, so you can't have your phone. Like you, you can't talk to anybody. You're sitting on your board, just waiting and watching the waves till you hit like the right one. And you have to focus on like how fast it's coming, the pace you're like paddling, and then you have to still focus on getting up on the board. There's such a focus that you just unplug from everything. I think that's what I appreciate. Like just that peacefulness and you're in the water. Like it's so beautiful. There's something about like my brain just firing all this happiness, you know? Well, yes, so focus and attention seems to be the main skill. And you know what's interesting in our world? I was watching uh, a documentary about focus and attention because of smartphones, and lo and behold, I didn't know this. I used to always say this is due to variable ratio reinforcement, which is essentially cell phones operate like um, casinos, uh, slot machines and casinos. Um, and in fact, one of the engineers was saying that was specifically how they design things, especially with social media sites to make them like these slot machines. So what you see is people unable to sustain attention anymore. They pick up their phones whenever they have any kind of discomfort, including boredom or anxiety. So they continually have these decreases in attention, which is 
which is causing more problems in our world of mental health. So actually paying attention and focusing, which a lot of people talk about meditation and they find that very helpful. But I have long advocated surfing for my clients who surf. I'm like, dude, you are doing meditation. I can't make time for meditation. For me, surfing is meditation. So I didn't, I'm like, lean into the thing that brings you pleasure, you know, those types of things. If it's listening to music or hiking in nature or um, doing the dishes, all of these things can be focus and attention activities. Um, But surfing seems to have, in this study, they mentioned specifically, you have to pay attention for safety. You have to pay attention for skill. You have to pay attention uh, as part of the ability to be with other people on the water, which is important. And you have to learn how to not only avoid other surfers and swimmers who are out in the water, but you have to learn how to, you know, who goes where and when. And then you have to make decisions. Um, And the decisions are split second. So you've really got to pay attention to so many things. And in anyone who's had a wipeout, as I have, and I'm sure you have, (laughs) it's part of, um, and, you know, um, or, or like I, I banged into someone else and I got a concussion and my head was just a big head of blood. Um, and, you know, that that happens. Um, and it's all sometimes you can't control things because obviously I, no one wanted that to happen. Um, but it, it can happen doing such a thing. The stress reduction thing, as you mentioned, Zoe, is incredibly important um and stre- or and you mentioned it brian uh, everyone mentioned it um uh, is incredibly important but also they found increases in workplace productivity for people who are surfers and i had to find that really interesting because my clients who surf actively some of them are in their 40s 50s and up um They're highly productive people, CEOs and other things. One client of mine uh, moved closer to the beach. And I'm so happy for him because I think that's where he needs to be. Yeah, the surf bone is connected to the brain bone and all of the stuff. (laughs) So, you know, you, you could see how it would be so good for you physically and mentally. And, yeah, I think I think that follows 100 percent. That's great. Look, Brian. <laughs> no, I agree. And I'm so happy every time I do it. There's been times where I don't even catch a wave. Like, the waves just aren't happening. And I'm still so happy just sitting on the water. There's something so therapeutic of just being in that environment that is just, yeah, it's healing, honestly. It is incredible. There are some downsides to surfing, one which I talked about, which are injuries, Mm -hmm. also overcrowding. And I hated that the article said this. They said they can be a behavioral addiction. It's substantial withdrawal symptoms suffered by some if they're deprived of surfing. I, I will tell you, this is where I differ from some therapists. I don't have a problem with some behavioral addictions, and this would be one. Unless it is interfering with your life, if someone is very connected to surfing and feels like they want to do it every day and misses it when they don't, that to me is a good thing. It's only when it interferes with your life. Let, let's say they're not going to work or they're not attending to relationships or other things, then that yes. That be a problem. Yeah, of course that would be a problem. But uh, maybe that's going to be how some people might define addiction. But I, I find people throw that word around a lot when it really shouldn't be. So keep on surfing. Worst things you one could be addicted to. <laughs> there are worse sure. things. So speaking of, why are people so paranoid? Well, the Oxford the University of Oxford did a survey with 10,382 UK adults. So this was a big study of England. The these big survey studies come out of England. I absolutely love it. England does the coolest stuff. This was published in the British Medical Journal of Mental Health, BMJ Mental Health. And they did, and this is a good journal, and they did a survey of paranoia. And that's defined as excessive mistrust of other people. So anyone paranoid here? Tell me which group you guys fall into. Um, very trusting, generally trusting, generally mistrustful, or very mistrustful of others. What do you guys fall into? What are you? What about you, Zoe? 
I'll let very, you know uh, very mistrustful. Same. I've been therapy before. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> you guys are both very mistrustful. Wow. Okay. Like, I'm a nice person, but it's going to take me a while to like really open up and be like, oh, okay, I can trust that person, you know? And even then, I might have some second thoughts. Well, I would say I'm generally trusting. So I'm a little bit different than you guys. And it's interesting because we're going to talk about why people might be paranoid. And I certainly have some reasons. Let's just say that. But I don't know. Maybe it's uh, I could tell you what perhaps why. But 14 percent are very trusting of others. 61 percent are generally trusting. That's me. I'm in that big group. So 75 percent people are generally or, or very trusting of other people. So most people walk around in kind of a good place. 20% are generally mistrustful. So they have like, a, you know, they have what we say, walk around with a jaundiced eye. They're always looking a little bit suspiciously. And you guys are very mistrustful. So, you know, I don't know what, I guess. Uh, I wasn't always. You weren't always. No. Okay. The world's not a nice always. place, so. Thank you, Ryan. <laughs> I'm just saying it as it is. It's true. I wasn't always distrustful. I do want to say, though, that the study looked at paranoid beliefs versus conspiracy beliefs, and there's a little bit of a nuanced difference. Paranoid thoughts tend to be held in isolation and involve perceptions of harm to self, where conspiracy belief, the beliefs are shared by others and involve a perception of collective rather than personal harm. So you can be both. That's certainly the case. We probably see a high overlap. I actually don't know what that overlap is, but the conspiracy beliefs were not really looked at in this study. So we looked at paranoid thoughts. 20% um, of the study said they have regular suspicious thoughts and 5 to 8% experience very strong paranoia. But I don't know. I have suspicious thoughts. I mean, I'll have a thought will fly through my head and I'll think something like, oh, I wonder if, you know, blah, 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 like that person has a gun. And then I then I just flies through my head. I don't really think much of it. Um, but I do know what it's like to be around extremely paranoid people. And yeah, so let's talk about why the paranoia. Discrimination was highly influential. So it seemed like the primary reason a lot of people feel paranoia is perception of discrimination. I say perception because if they feel like they're being discriminated against and they're wh whether real or um, imagined, they, they're going to probably feel more paranoia. Paranoia arises from a sense of vulnerability, a worry you'll be the target of someone more powerful than yourself. That's going to increase paranoia. And discrimination is seen as unfair treatment, get this, because of age, skin color, ethnicity, sex, gender expression, sexual orientation, mental and physical health, body shape, disability, and religious beliefs. And it's yeah. probably more exhaustive than that. Yeah. People of color, for sure. I, there's no question that we, you know, can have so, so many kinds of issues around, you know, past treatment, perceived or otherwise. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of those. You said female, a person of color. I mean, you know, there are a lot of them there that apply to me. And uh, so this may have had something to shade with shading and coloring, you know, my, my feelings and thoughts sometimes around any number of things that have transpired in life. Well, and I think sometimes there is a concept we use in psychology, which is called healthy cultural paranoia. So we actually see this phenomenon happen in certain groups, especially when they have reasons to feel discrimination or feel um, that they might be more threatened in certain environments. Uh, so when we look at healthy cultural paranoia, it's like somebody who lives in a, uh, an area where there's more crime or, or things are a little bit more threatening. Um, somebody who belongs to a discriminated group who's going around a group who might discriminate against them. Um, it's going into certain circumstances and or um, things that are going on. And we're certainly seeing that a lot right now as we're seeing a rise in uh, anti-Arab, Islamophobic, uh, anti-Semitic, 
um, things going on in this country where people are, are targeting groups and taking uh, squaring off. Um, I think this has been, and so that those groups might have what we call healthy cultural paranoia, where they're going to be more suspicious and be more on the lookout and exhibit something we call hypervigilance, like looking around the corner for danger. Well, um, they're they're actually, you know, with the advent of of a lot of the things that have kind of been in the media and that have transpired with with people, um, with the police or what have you. I mean, even the theater has been called out for their lack of casting opportunities uh, at various Shakespeare festivals, Shakespeare, the- you know, always the white men and women, right? And so now you can go to the theater and you'll watch the Layman trilogy, you know, in London, and you'll have two white gentlemen and a black guy, and the three of them are supposed to be brothers. But see, that that's only just now been happening. <laughs> never happened. We can talk about that sometime. It's an interesting phenomenon in theater. I've certainly observed that. Um, Absolutely. I've never bothered by um, um, casting differences. Uh, In fact, sometimes I really appreciate the differences. I've seen incredibly strong actors. I mean, a good example is Hamilton, which, you know, they have all the founding fathers played by people of color. Um, And it's it's absolutely fantastic. I mean, Beautiful. I'm getting goosebumps Incredible. thinking of it. Yeah, yeah. it's, it's yes, phenomenal. But, but this was not the way. This was not the but, way. But yeah, but if you have a, if you have a question in your mind as an audience member, like how are they related, and you can't get it answered, then I, I, that will distract you from watching the show. <laughs> That's the only thing. You know, the the point is is that people of color, you know, and 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 down that list, down that line, have reason to be paranoid very very real reasons and i think that's i think that's what's really interesting here is we need to look at this issue of discrimination now paranoia also we can look at people who are very isolated depressed etc they tend to exhibit more paranoid features and what's interesting is they probably maybe i'm just a question in my own mind maybe that's adaptive because they perceive the world in a more threatening way also people who've been bullied as children and experienced child abuse they make one feel more vulnerable as adults so we're certainly you know people who've been through those things are going to feel more paranoia Okay. Now, we look at protective strategies people with paranoia use, which is limiting time and social situation, watching out for danger. That's what I called hypervigilance earlier, and trying to be inconspicuous, like kind of hiding. Um, And acting, they're acting as if the world is unsafe actually prevents them from discovering the world is actually safer than they might think it is. Does that make sense? So, people who are paranoid don't do certain things and i i can say i have a family member who was not paranoid this is this family member was pretty wild i would have to say she was a wild one um she worked at a radio station here she would always work with all these rock bands she was going to every gig flying around she was one of these people who just had nothing but fun at work and then she married a cop and he told her he was a very paranoid guy and she she he told her basically you know the world is a dangerous place now she's afraid to go through our very city los angeles that she once worked and thrived in and tells me all the time how dangerous it is but i'm like okay i get it but i live here and it's not quite what you're saying but nonetheless um well i can't do anything about her perceptions but the thing is she won't go back she won't come back it's because of that fear so she doesn't get to learn or relearn that the world is not as unsafe as she might think it is so mm-hmm. it's it's important when we to push ourselves in certain things now these beliefs i was also interested they uncovered certain beliefs around paranoia i am weak i am worthless i am unloved Also, images, people laughing at them or harming them. You know, people, when you talk about people laughing at them, you know, I mean, so what? But how interesting that people are so afraid of being humiliated that that might cause more paranoid beliefs. And also, I added this one. They didn't uncover it. But my experience with people who are paranoid will often believe that life is unfair. 
and they'll they have reasons to believe this because of whatever they experienced in life and they will often see life as unfair and then thus they can't get a break etc cetera, etc cetera. now some people life really is unfair if you're not a person blessed with looks if you don't live in the majority population etc you're going to have more problems so um, people that don't have money etc i mean you really life really is unfair if you really get right down to it but these are people who see every situation as such that yeah. makes sense life is tough Life is tough. And so speaking of discrimination, I want to talk about a hair salon owner in northern Michigan uh, who is facing discrimination charge from the state's Department of Civil Rights after its owner posted on social media the following. Allow me to read this for you. If a human identifies as anything other than a man slash woman, please seek services at a local pet groomer. If you are not well, you are not welcome at this salon period, with period spelled out, um, should you request to have a particular pronoun used, please note, we may simply refer to you as, hey, you. Um, this was salon owner Christine Geiger of Traverse City Studio 8 Hair Lab. Um, oops. Um, so to go back, uh, Christine filed her own lawsuit against Traverse City, which I thought was interesting, and I guess three citizens who were in this group, and accused them of violating her, her First Amendment rights for filing the original complaint, or, or for for uh, that they violated by filing that complaint. It was really interesting to me. She told the uh, uh, Associated Press, I just don't want the woke dollar. I'd rather be not as busy than to have to do services that I don't agree with. Fine, Christine. I mean, but she's also starting a business. She also has a business, and businesses are licensed. Number one, you have a business license, and so you have to agree to follow these rules. Number two, as uh, someone who has a, a licensed profession like a hairdresser, um, they follow, I have a licensed profession. You cannot, you have to follow certain rules, and I can't imagine that it's okay to say you can discriminate. Which was really interesting to me is she's kind of off base here. If she really wanted to not see a client of a particular type, she can just say, I don't think I'm a good provider for you. I don't think I can provide the best service for you. She can even help them find a, a provider who might be a better suited. Um, at least that's what in my profession you do with people that you're not qualified to, to help or you think there might be an issue that interrupts, including your own personal prejudices. Um, but you don't discriminate and you don't say negative things against people. Yeah. I think what, what I hated about this is she said it was her First Amendment, but not sort of acknowledging the fact that she harmed people by saying something like this as a business owner. Um, and this does create harm. And this actually, there's a study that was not so surprising out this week. The transgender adults age 50 and older in the United States, ele they have an elevated suicide risk. I don't think this is at all surprising. Approximately one quarter or 26% acknowledging having a thought in the last year that they wanted to kill themselves. So a serious thought that they actually wanted to kill themselves during the last year. It's only about 5% for the general population. This is over a quarter, just over a quarter of people 50 and over who are transgendered. And it's because of issues like this. But to be fair, I did want to say also 11 to 17 percent of older adults in the U.S. have thoughts like this. The discrimination is double here. It's against people who are trans and people who are older. Um, so it's it's a really of course, you would expect the double the suicide risk. Also, the study, there's data from a 2000, the study came from a data from a 2015 U.S. National Transgender Survey. They surveyed 3,724 3, transgender adults age 50 and over. It was done by our very own Cal State Long Beach School of Social Work, and it was published in the journal Aging and Mental Health. So, Interesting. So to, if we look at the real world consequences of discrimination, I think we have to think about this. I, I could go off on this, but I think we have to start to realize that when we say hateful things about other people, when we do hateful things, when we discriminate against others, we are impacting their mental health in some significant 
and severe ways. So it, we need to think about that in our society. And like you said too, Dr. Greg, where it's not just affecting this specific group, it's opening up a can of worms to discriminate against other groups that they just don't want to you know, provide services to. And like you said, it's a public business it's for the public you can't really choose who you you know provide services to or not well i mean in fact you you kind of could it, it, but you don't need to be discriminating about it you can say look i want to i want to help um you know certain ladies who go to this particular church i'll just cut their hair like i want to market myself to them i'm just going to do that but you can't turn away or do public statements about other people that's the bottom line i mean you could market yourself and you could you try to you know i'm not saying i'm advocating for discrimination i'm not but the fact is i think she's using that sort of you know first amendment thing to excuse her behavior which is really far more damaging than perhaps perhaps we'd like to admit it um okay so sorry we're gonna make a hard right turn zoe yes. i hate this when people tell me not to bring anything i feel to a party a holiday party or gathering a dinner party i don't know what to do because when they say <laughs> don't they, bring anything they say, don't don't bring anything just bring yourself and then everyone bring else yourself. brings something your presence is your present. Everyone yeah. else brings something. Yeah. So what what do we do in that circumstance? So what I tend to do is I think on it. It's like, do I know the dog? Do I know the dog's behavior, what the dog can and can't have? I'll take something for the animal, cat, bird, what have you. Um, if I don't know the dog or the cat, I will tend not to take anything for the pet because there are many times when dogs can't have certain things, you know, cats can't eat certain things. They all have their own little metabolisms, but one can always buy a really pretty little floral arrangement that might be seasonal that could go on the table. Or if it's Christmas, you could find a uh, Christmas ornament that they might really enjoy. Um, something little like that, that that is better than walking to the front door, nothing in hand. One of the things I'm also really careful about, if I can be, is not taking alcoholic beverages if I'm not sure whether or not they're drinkers or not. So you don't want to just presume that somebody would enjoy a bottle of wine. Sometimes they'll say, well, it's okay, I have, I have company. I have friends that come over who, who would enjoy this, you know, so... Um, so those are just a few little things you can think about. So the the principle here I can gather is that still bring something because you want to acknowledge to the host how special it is that they invited you. And they go all out. People who have host, host will, I mean, they spend wow. days, weeks preparing. They, they prepare meals and food and drinks. And I mean, every, and they have to clean the house, et cetera, and clean it after you leave. So it's so much work a host has yeah, to and go. It's, a, it's expensive too. So expensive. I always say a host is a combination of a hoe and a saint because they're like H O S T, ho saint combo. Oh, there I'm it is. Write that down. Yeah. So <laughs> the bottom line is you want to acknowledge them, but when they say don't bring anything, cause they're saying it for a lovely reason because they want you to come as you are. They don't want you to like. Go ex to go all out. They want to provide the service, but at the same time, you want to acknowledge things. So it puts you in this weird social bind. So I'm glad to have something to do because I will. I've gone when people have said that and made that mistake. I went to a party once where they said, "Don't bring anything for dinner. We're providing everything." I brought a dessert. That was a mistake because, of course, they had desserts planned. I didn't think of that. I don't know why. That was years ago. But the it's just things like this. So thinking of some kind of side gift or flowers i think that's a lovely a lovely little idea. candle that a, smells like pumpkin or cinnamon candle. you know there's so many little things that you can do so that's a nice thing to do we don't ever want to try to kind of like show up empty-handed i mean if you're friends with these people and you see them every week you know that could be maybe not maybe not something that you have to do but you can always you know take a little something for the cat or for the bird or you know Something for the cat or the bird. That sounds incredibly wonderful. Um, maybe a cat, maybe a bird for the cat. 
Maybe that would be. No, or a cap for the bird wouldn't work as much. Well, you know, thank you so much, Zoe, Brian. Thank you so much. That does wrap up our show for today. I know we, we covered a lot of ground. Um, how, how was it for you? Do you want to assign yourself some homework, Brian? Oh, I mean, if you're going to do the 750, I will definitely... I didn't say I would do it. <laughs> well, then maybe I can't say I'm going to do it. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, Notice I'm, gonna, I'll I'm not do chiming in. <laughs> do you? Would you want to do it, Zoe? No. <laughs> no, I'm in therapy. I don't need to write something. Same. Anymore. I'm like, I'm going to talk about it later. <laughs> I think it's incredibly valuable. Well, you writing a journal isn't necessarily doing therapy. It really is just writing, just writing and your thoughts oh. and reflecting. So it doesn't have to be about it doesn't have to be purposeful. It could even be without a purpose. And I think there's value to that. Sometimes like when you go to therapy, you don't know what you're going to talk about. And those are often the most valuable sessions. Often the most comes out in those sessions. I could, you know plan a week full of meals i could write that out and then that way that question <laughs> that 340 million americans ask themselves every day what's for dinner could we could also off. try something new we all do something new this week and then we share what we did when we come back all right that might be easier like just something new I like it. okay simple we'll start simple we can't give away like the hard homework apparently 750 is too much <laughs> well that wraps up our show for today thank you this is dr greg and zoe and brian thank you everyone we're going to bid you farewell just to remind you to be present be flexible and be kind thank you so much thanks dr greg